the death of George Floyd. What's remarkable about this event is its sacrificial nature that, that occupied the sort of symbolic center of the society. And yet, once again, it largely reinforced similar fault lines rather than producing some kind of new coming together. The year 2020 presents a number of interesting illustrations of some of the dynamics that Girard explores throughout his work. On one hand, we had um, the sort of generalized culture war fragmentation of society that had accelerated under Donald Trump's presidency and the various kinds of you know, ongoing crises associated with that. But then we have this apparent eruption of a completely new and um, unprecedented crisis in the form of the pandemic, the arrival of the uh, coronavirus from, from China. And so, I mean, there are a few things to observe about those, uh, those weeks and months. Uh, the first, you know, most broadly is that you did have a kind of period of sort of generalized pacification and relative unanimity where at least for a short time, you know, the country all kind of accepted shutting down for the most part with, with a few minor exceptions, right? And, and even Donald Trump himself, who was seen as a, um, you know, later seen as, as sort of rejecting lockdowns and other pandemic measures, you know, at least briefly seem to accept and, and promote this idea that we needed to, um, you know, shut everything down for two weeks. So, you know, there, there was this, this brief period where um, a kind of unanimity was, was achieved. And, you know, one thing that stands out to me during this, um, this time was, I think, the very controversial uh, former New York Times editorial staffer and columnist Barry Weiss had some column about how, you know, basically the culture war, you know, the COVID pandemic had ended the culture war, right? Nobody was thinking about that because everybody was just thinking about how to stay safe from the virus. And of course, you know, this within a few weeks seemed laughable because it didn't take long for the, you know, previous fractures of the society to reassert themselves. But nevertheless, um, there was, and, and actually to intensify, right? But nevertheless, there was this brief, strange period of almost uncanny calm, right? But, you know, even prior to that, there were some sort of odd, um, some odd manifestations of this kind of fragmentation and fracturing. And, you know, several of them were quite revealing in relation to the, the um, to Girard's thinking. So one is that, you um, on, on the left side of the spectrum, what you largely saw was, was not a concern about the virus itself, but a concern that the arrival of the virus would lead to the scapegoating of certain groups, specifically Asian Americans, right? And so what was, what was considered to be more dangerous than the virus itself was this social effect it was feared that it would produce, which was, um, you know, essentially xenophobia. And so, you know, while this on one level seems uh, seems like a, you know, to, to many like a strange reaction, right? And one that also stands in contrast with the fact that several weeks later, most of those in the same cohort, you know, were suddenly extremely concerned about the virus, more concerned about the virus than about, you know, the, the social effects it would produce. Nevertheless, you know, there was a kind of insight in this reaction, right? Which, which brings me to my first point about Girard's ideas about plagues, right? Which is that they, they tend to, you know, um, underlie situations and exacerbate situations of broader social crisis, which therefore lead to an attempted resolution through scapegoating, right? And so Girard discusses this in the context of the plague in the late Middle Ages and the resulting scapegoating of Jews in particular, right? So the, the anti-Semitic attacks. So there is a, a, a historical basis for this idea, right? That the arrival of a plague will lead to um, this kind of effect. And so, you know, whatever we might say about it, there was a certain insight in this, um, in this fear, right? It did recognize this 
this widely understood, um, you know, the thing that plagues lead to. Now, you know, what both this response and Barry Weiss's response suggest is an inability to see how the natural and the cultural or social are are inseparable, right? The way that, um, you know, for for Barry Weiss, the idea was, well, now we're all worried about this natural, you know, biological crisis, so we're not worried about culture wars anymore, right? For the, the sort of liberals um, sort of hand-wringing about the potential for xenophobia was that, you know, if we worry too much about this biological crisis, then we're going to, it's going to tip us over into this violent xenophobia. And so what both these um, perspectives failed to grasp was the way that these two things would, would eventually become, you know, inseparable and intertwined. And so, you know, what we saw during the the sort of height of the pandemic in the spring of 2020 was was precisely this, that, you know, the effect of the pandemic was to exacerbate and multiply the kind of pre-existing social crises that we associate with the culture war as well as, as well as other ones, as well as producing new and, and distinct ones. And so, you know, where we saw this brief period of unanimity, right, where basically there was a unanimity produced by the sense of a common enemy, right, which is the virus itself, right? Um, but this proved evanescent precisely because um, this common enemy could not really fully take shape until it could be identified with particular human moral agents, right? So one version of this would be, you know, that of a kind of xenophobic scapegoating where, where certain social groups or ethnic groups would be... Um, treated as the carriers and vectors of the virus, and thus, um, you know, their, their sort of expulsion from the society would somehow bring about the recomposition of the social order. But, you know, for various reasons, there was, there, you know, and, and in fact, like, on decent historical grounds, there was a, a pre-existing wariness of this potential, which, you know, prevented this outcome. And so, you know, what, what we ended up with was um, a, a sort of refracturing into largely two two major opposing camps, for one of which ultimately it was Trump himself who became the vector and carrier of the virus, right? And you know the sense of that was ultimately um, you know ultimately led us up to um, you know the moment of his expulsion from social media in in early uh, 2021, but. On the other side, you know, on one hand, you had Trump continuing to use the term China virus and so on. But, you know, in fact, this kind of xenophobic, um, at least in a political and ideological sense, you know, even though there have been these hate crimes and things like that, you know, most of them seem to be committed by people without a particularly strong, um, you know, political set of motivations. And so in a political and ideological sense, what you actually instead saw on the the um, on the right of the spectrum was this idea of the the lib pandemic, right? So the the point here was simply, and again, there was a kind of splitting where the the biological virus itself, um, through this framing, ceased to be of concern, and instead, you know, the idea was that you know it was the lib pandemic because the real significance of it was not the virus itself, but the um, you know, various kinds of social interventions that had been, um, had been introduced on, you know, under the pretext of the virus, right? So we had these two um, opposing camps. Obviously, it's, it's a little bit more complex, complex than that, which were not only um, incapable of at arriving of the, ki- of the kind of unanimity, right, in terms of moral attribution that, you know, might have allowed for a kind of um, coalescence. They, they were also incapable of even sort of epistemologically grasping the object in the same way, right? So, in other words, they, um, they had, you know, completely different assessments of the relationship between the social and biological realities of the, of the period. So they, they didn't even, they weren't even really looking at the same thing. And so, you know, any kind of unanimity of the sort that, that for Girard would be the prerequisite of any kind of true resolution of a social crisis, 
was impossible not simply because they had different enemies or different, um, you know, scapegoats, but because they did not even perceive the reality in the same way. So, you know, this is more or less how I would describe the first period of, of that year. But then, of course, the, the, the event that, that sort of brought an end to that period, right, was the um, death of George Floyd on Memorial Day weekend of 2020, right? And, you know, regardless of the lack of any sort of ultimate unanimity in, in one's assessment of the event, what's remarkable about this event is its sacrificial nature that, like a sacrificial act um, in an archaic society, it became the sort of center of attention around which the entire society was was sort of polarized, right? That it, it suddenly occupied the center, right, of, of our sort of um, collective gaze. And so um, by occupying the center of our collective gaze in that way, it, you know, in a sense, brought about a sort of symbolic shift. And obviously that shift had numerous effects that have been widely observed, such as, you know, the people who believe that we needed to um, stay home and, and avoid large gatherings suddenly, you know, poured out into the streets and, and were encouraged to do so by the same public health officials who had previously told people not to do things like this. Um, so, you know, that's all been, been covered extensively here. But, you know, once again, what we have is a kind of um, something approaching a kind of coalescence, at least around a sort of shared attention to this, um, this particular object, in this case, a sort of, you know, violent death that, that occupied the sort of symbolic center of the society. And yet, once again, you know, and, and did produce remarkable effects in terms of the kind of activity and, and sort of um, gathering together it was able to galvanize. And yet, once again, it, it did not, um, you know, it, it, it largely reinforced um, similar fault lines rather than, um, and, you know, so along somewhat new lines, rather than, you know, producing some kind of new coming together. So what, I mean, what, what it did do, I would argue, is, is sort of galvanize, and, and this is why, you know, I would argue the ultimate effect of the, the death of George Floyd as a sort of mediatic and symbolic event was the election of Joe Biden insofar as you know, what it really did was was galvanize the collective that would make up the Democratic electorate into, you know, a, a sort of, um, you know, a, a meaningful whole that, you know, saw itself as having a common project, right? And so, you know, ultimately, whatever the um, ostensible issues raised by that event were, the real, you know, end point that it led to, I would argue, is that um, decisive, you know, concluding event of that, of that year. And so, you know, again, what, what we see in, in, in these cases is a sort of ongoing sense of crisis and fragmentation, which goes through these brief periods where there's something approaching a kind of coalescence and unanimity, which is then followed by a kind of reassertion of, of division and fracture which, you know, um, which reinforces and, and underlines existing divisions and provides them with kind of new, a new symbolic basis rather than, you know, ultimately bringing about the kind of um, resolution that, um, you know, that, that Girard saw as the, the sort of um, end point of a sacrificial cycle. Hey, what's up? If you enjoyed this video, take a second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. We publish videos like this several times a week. And also, if you're interested in studying the work of Rene Girard on your own, we made an awesome, totally free 18-page study guide that you can download at girardcourse.com. It's expertly curated. It's in a logical sequence that's going to help you master his entire body of work at your own pace. You can go ahead and get that at girardcourse.com. All right, that's all I got for you. Over and out.